Thank you for tuning in to Bibonicon 52. It's Saturday evening, and that means it's time for another reading. Uh, right now, we have one of our New Mexico authors. He's the author of the Sky People, the Terminator 2 series, uh, the Black Chamber series, the Change Emberverse series, and Shadow Spawn. Please help us in welcoming Stephen M. Sterling. Yay! Okay. Uh, now, normally, I would read from a book in progress at this point. However, I've been having um, a very bad year so far in 2021. Um, my wife of 33 years died. I broke my leg. My asthma has reactivated and I just had oral surgery. So I have been a little behind in my writing schedule. Uh, okay, just making sure that this doesn't get in the way. Okay, that looks okay. Okay, so what I'm going to be reading from is the fourth book in my Black Chamber series, which came out in March. I'm going to be reading from the third chapter. This is an alternate history series. And <clears throat> I think this chapter uh, gives enough of the background for people to follow along. So I shall begin my reading. Daggers in Darkness, chapter three. American National Airways, Airship Bunker Hill, approaching General Sherman Airship Haven, San Francisco, California, October 5th, 1922 AD, 1922 B. <clears throat> Golly, Kira said beside Luz, leaning on the railing and looking down the Bay City through the broad inward slanting windows of the Bunker Hills Observation Gallery. They're tearing the place up for fair, aren't they? Even more than when the aunties and I were here for the exposition in 15. Of course, we came in by train. My, that was a treat. My first trip outside the East. And everything at the exposition was so beautiful. Well, not the Midway, but that was so much fun. The president was a very good friend of Daniel Burnham's, Luz said. The city planner who did Union Station and all those other buildings in Washington and cleaned up them all, Kira said, and who designed the first steel frame buildings in Chicago. That was the sort of thing her engineer's mind noticed. That's him, and they weren't the only commissions he got from the White House. Uncle Teddy was very impressed with the way he handled the Chicago Exposition back in 93, the White City. He's the one who came up with that saying, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood. The cloth-covered aluminum of the gallery's railing was warm and rock steady under her hand, with only the slightest vibration from the engines and the corridors along the airship's flanks 50 feet above their heads. The sun was high overhead. It was quarter past noon and the shadow of the airship floated over the city below as they slowed and descended and came around into the wind from the west. It was Mr. Burnham, Kira said, surprised. I thought that was the president. The chatter of pre-landing conversations in different languages went through the big space around them as people waited for the docking, English being the most common by a large margin, Spanish next, but including Portuguese and French and something Scandinavian and Yiddish and Japanese. And she thought Arabic which she didn't speak but could recognize, along with several others she didn't know at all. It gave them perfect privacy if they were soft-voiced without attention-drawing whispers, although there were people at the rail not far away. No, that was Burnham, but it sounds like something El Jefe would say, doesn't it, she said. Catching the Bunker Hill in Los Angeles had been part of their cover. They'd have taken the Coastal Express train if they were traveling in their own personas. This airship was one of 10 on the Vancouver to Buenos Aires run, with half a dozen stops in between. Documents would show that her party of five adults and four children had booked through from Mexico City and stopped off in L.A. before getting on the next flight north a few days later, as travelers often did. No wonder they got on well, Kira said. No wonder indeed. The president thought it was very short-sighted of the San Franciscans to reject Burnham's plan for rebuilding the city after the earthquake in 06, she continued. Back then, the federal government didn't have nearly as much say in that sort of thing as it does now. Kira sighed. I don't recall 06 very clearly. I remember hearing about the quake and the fire and feeling sorry for all the poor people who lost their homes, but at 11 distant things don't strike home. <clears throat> it was like a story. And of course I'd never left Boston, never did until a trip to New York to buy books for the store later, Da being too sick by then. I was 15. We were staying in Mexico City that year. Me papa was working on a water supply contract there. But I cried when I saw the pictures in the newspapers. We visited here often and we had family friends then who lived in town. Old San Francisco, it was a mess, but it had an indescribable charm. I suppose they just wanted to get roofs over their heads again as fast as they could. 
but they're doing Mr. Burnham's plan now, sure, and they are. They certainly were with modifications, ones that make it even more grandiose, Luz thought, which y todos incluyo yo, dijimos que no so podía hacer, she murmured, voicing the thought aloud. She would have thought it couldn't be done. Since the 1912 election, what Theodore Roosevelt wanted badly enough, he got, and even America's brief, eventful participation in the last 18 months of the Great War had only slowed down San Francisco's transformation temporarily. And the party loved big plans and massive projects anyway. California was strongly progressive, one of the PRP's heartlands, and hence abundant, abundantly showered with its largesse. Even Los Angeles, that promised land of boom and bust subdividers, speculative build now, damn tomorrow boosterism, had a city plan and a progressive style metro area government with a figurehead mayor and a city manager with an engineering degree running things now. Albeit they'd swallowed hard at the green belts and easements that the leadership insisted on, lest the place and the suburbs it spawned swallow everything between the mountains and the sea. Though naturally enough, the plan there had been drafted by Burnham's greatest rival, Charles Robinson, and the Angelinos swore it was a much better plan and that they'd implement it quicker and more efficiently. And LA had a nicer climate anyway and, and, and finishing with an animal scream of so take back to a feet Mongol base any snobs, she thought. Unlike some in other states, both cities were actually charging ahead full tilt to implement their plans too. From 1200 feet, you could see the North Pacific pointing from the peninsula that held the city laid out like a giant room sized map one that showed everything, but still gave you a visceral sense of the sheer size of it all. And how Burnham's great tree-lined radial arteries, and massive squares and curving parkways now slashed through the old simple grid that had been laid out in the gold rush era with no regard to hills. A third of the city's vastly enlarged area, Metro San Francisco now included everything down to what had been San Mateo County at the base of the peninsula, was slated to remain in open public spaces enough for a population of millions. Though right now it was in raw mounds of earth and fresh plantings and trenches for irrigation pipes and sewers and water and electricity, where parks and lakes for bandstands and sports grounds and amphitheaters and museums and parade grounds and a Tivoli style amusement park would be. Other developments were just as ambitious, factory zones and new docks and American National Airways second major airship yard. The new housing was laid out on the Savannah Squares model, fashionably patriotic as a memorial since Savannah had been the only American city where the U-boat had managed to launch VGAS in 1916. <coughs> Even with the chamber provided warning time, over a thousand had died. She had a friend whose parents and sisters had perished there. Right now it was the outlines of Garden Center Squares fading into scrub. They were too high to see the ones marked by surveyor's pegs. And that's the Tower of Jewels rising again, Kira said, pointing to what had been the Twin Peaks in the center of town. That was the first time I heard the president when he gave that great speech in 1915 about how the buildings of the exposition were too wonderful to vanish like a dream of beauty and order. And that they'd be rebuilt in imperishable marble and granite to glorify the city in America for ages to come. I cried, I cried then myself, but for happiness meaning rebuilt in nearly imperishable steel and concrete and then covered in marble and granite cladding, was observed. Well, yes, but that's to make them earthquake proof, like your dad did our own house. So many clever features there. I wish, I wish you could have met him and your mother, though. And I wish he and Mima could have lived to see their grandchildren, Luz thought. It was bittersweet. Though that would have had awkward elements, as that witness that cause for thought, Kira just had. The second incarnation of the Tower of Jewels was to be 650 feet high, an elongated wedding cake of Beaux-Arts marble statue and column neoclassicism in the style currently known as American Imperial, wrapped around office space and God alone knew what else, topped with a giant illuminated globe held between the upswept wings of even more titanic eagle, and the building covered like the shorter and squatter exposition original in hundreds of thousands of Bohemian style, but this time patriotically locally made, cut crystal jewels, each strung on brass wire in front of a little mirror to make the whole thing shimmer like a rippling coat of multicolored sequins in sunlight. Though she remembered that the night views, the searchlights playing on it, were even more impressive and not quite as too, too much as it was in the daytime, she thought, because darkness and flashing lights hid the overdone allegorical statuary. It wasn't my favorite part of the Panama Pacific Exposition, despite the fact I really like that general style of architecture. 
Maybeck's work with the Palace of Fine Arts was exquisite and will make a superb art school down in the Marina District. The tower, not so much. Atop a 900 foot hill and at the near center of the city, it would certainly dominate San Francisco in the day forever, rearing 1500 feet above the sea and visible like a shaft of iridescent flame for 100 miles at night. It's not just the tower either, Kira said enthusiastically. It's the reservoir they're making there too, ready to flow down by gravity in an emergency. So clever. Once it's full of that fine, pure mountain water from the new Hetch Hetch aqueduct, even the worst earthquake won't be able to cut, the city, cut off the city's water supply and let everything burn the way it did the last time. And it will be so pretty as well, all surrounded by gardens with little boats for parents and children. Very true, Luz said. That's progress for you. This will be the most beautiful, the finest city in the whole world, with the sea and the bay and what we're building, Kira said, with a new minted, Cali minted Californian's state chauvinism. I'm so proud we're part of all this that everyone is now. A new giant version of the court of the universe from the exposition was being rebuilt at the eastern foot of the hill at the junction of five great avenues, 350 yards by 250. It was to be centered on fountains and flower banks and reflecting pools, ridden by immense curving colonnades of green streaked red marble and 200 foot high triumphal arches with mosaic murals of extremely edited historical scenes. It was all a little like the Piazza di San Pietro before St. Peter's in Rome, but surrounded by gold domed buildings, ones that looked like the Hagia Sophia's bigger, richer, flashier dressing sister. Those would hold the new city hall and opera house and central library and archives and others this time, rather than exhibitions. It would be linked to the tower by an enormous stepped ceremonial stairway up the terraced gardens of the hillside, and on the inside by high capacity express elevators at the end of an arched tunnel. The plans called for an eventual link to a subway beneath, station beneath, on an as yet unbuilt subway system whose engineering problems in the earthquake zone were monumental, as Kira had eagerly told her in considerable detail. Today it was all steel skeletons and timber forms holding poured concrete, cranes and a vast expense of trampled dirt, machines and swarming ant tiny workers hard at it in the bright mid morning sun, the usual fog had burned off in the opening hours of the day. Kira's voice grew dreamy. And our children will bring their children here, and our grandchildren will bring their grandchildren up the Tower of Jewels until they're higher than this airship is now. And they'll take the little ones by the hand to the railing and they'll show it all to them, what we're building now and what comes after that we can't even imagine and say, your ancestors built this with their dreams and the sweat that makes dreams real. Your ancestors in blood and your ancestors in spirit too. All this they did for you and your children and children's children all their descendants and all the ones we call to join our great people from every land. So be strong, be brave, be wise and loyal. And when all this is yours, be worthy of them and their faith in you. <coughs> Let's side and lean closer, their shoulders touching, enjoying the contact and the slight strawberry scent of the other's hair as they dreamed together. They were silent for a long moment and then Luz shook herself and said solemnly, and at last we'll be able to hold up our heads when the ambassadors from Barzoom talk about the towers of Helium and John Carter, warlord of Mars. Oh, you, Kira laughed, poking your heart in the ribs and delivering another with each repetition. You, 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 you and your burrows. There aren't any cities on Mars and there won't be until we go there and build them. And when we do meet Dolce Amor, it'll be because people like Burroughs and Wells made us dream of it, Liz retorted. And people like your dower me built the ships, the spaceships, to get there. Just then there was a shrill, excited treble voice. Just then a shrill, excited treble voice called behind her. Obachan, look at me. I'm a birdie up in the sky. <coughs> <coughs> she turned to see Colleen dash by with her red locks fluttering over an enormous toothy grin, arms spread like a bird, pinafore fluttering her small shoes making a rapid patter on the spruce veneer of the deck between reckless hobs and flapping and one of the Taguchi sisters in close pursuit, dodging other passengers. Fortunately, little Colleen was looking over her shoulder and laughing and didn't see Susan Zhu's arms until they closed around her. I think the other passengers sitting at the small round tables and looking out the gallery windows were annoyed in a tight-lipped silent way. But War was smiling indulgently, about the usual ratio she'd gotten used to when the child got exuberant in public, but quite rightly it flipped if you couldn't control them fairly quickly, unless you were in a park or something of that sort. Over the wail of little girl per protest as Susan Zeus scooped her up, birdies apparently disliked having their flights cut short, Luz said, let's round them up, querida, 
and get them into their overcoats and secured for landing. All hands on deck, Kira agreed. Golly, but kids are labor intensive. I am never, ever going to have these myself. They'd exhaust a saint, Midori wheezed, a Buddhist saint. Why doesn't our species eat its young? Because we're not reptiles, Luz said dryly. Midori went on heedless. And how does anyone survive long enough to grow up? Daily miracles and a lot of hard work, Kira said cheerfully. Then Luciana, Mary, Patricia, then the mommy. Scene break. <clears throat> the landing section of the new General Sherman airship haven was all done, modern and efficient. But that was because it was the waterfront type used in port cities with reliably calm harbors. There were floating cradles for the dirigibles so they could launch and land in nose into the wind. Then they were nudged around by special tugs and slid neatly into giant hangars anchored to the shore with connections for fuel gas, lift gas, and loading arrangements. It had all been built in the Union Point shipyards a bit further south of here and floated in with even the paint job complete in burnt umber and parish blue. There would eventually be a waterfront building for arrivals and departures with all the bells and whistles from from baggage sorting behind the scenes to fancy waiting rooms, restaurants, and shops. It would be gigantic, though not necessarily by comparison to the hangars, which could accommodate the latest thousand foot metal clads with space to spare for future designs. And it would put the next door ferry building to shame, but in a vaguely similar Venetian Renaissance style. Right now, that was yet more muddy pits and dirt and grinding concrete mixers and hammering rivet guns in a mad rush before lunch hour with a timber bridge and a complex of temporary sheds threaded with even more temporary paths leading out to Embarcadero Avenue proper through the work site. All of them were full of more construction workers from engineers with blueprints on clipboards down to laborers and dungarees and Haven employees and passengers too, everyone needing to be careful amid buffeting crowds. <coughs> <coughs> Mothers with small children coming through, make way for the future, someone called. Sparing her the trouble of using that polite Department of Public Health and Eugenics approved version of the heartfelt, get out of the fucking way, you selfish pendejos. People dutifully squeezed aside to the loosen her party through the press. And other mothers and children, one of whom was about eight months pregnant, as well as leading a toddler, and flashed her a smile as Luz motioned her to go first. She vividly remembered that lumbering, waddling feeling, like being a cross between an obese duck and a seasick whale. They plunged into narrow, rickety, shadowy passageways suspended on temporary truss work and pilings across the foundation diggings, walled off with boards and chicken wire and combinations of both. Election posters still covered a fair bit from the last presidential contest and from for the upcoming midterms, though ordinary advertising rested below and in places above the party and Department of Public Information contributions. Everyone had known the result in advance of November 1920, and there wasn't much doubt who California was sending to the Senate and House this year, except for a few of the deeply stupid. The demoralized Democrats were a pathetic regional remnant these days, and the socialists a minor ginger group in a few big eastern cities with one solitary congresswoman named Flora Hamburger representing the Lower East Side of New York. Well, New York, as she put it, was thought. But the party didn't take chances it didn't have to, and it worked hard to get out the vote. 1920 had been quite the overall landslide 1916 had been, just after the German attempt to destroy America. But it had been close enough for government work, she thought. There were the usual cover, colorful stylized sheets showing great projects. The Department of Public Information could do that without being too nakedly partisan, because those were the massive public work programs that the Republican Party had accomplished or was working on, in which the states' rights, small government Democrats abominated. Boulder Gorge Dam, with the 1,200 by 700 foot American eagle on its downstream face, was always a favorite, along with the aqueducts and transmission lines bringing water and power to farms and cities. And the first run of the all electric Federal Express train between Boston and Washington at 90 miles an hour last June with just the beginning beneath it. Battleships and airships and soaring airplanes and powerful locomotives had their place too, and spick and span row houses or low rise apartment buildings replacing slums, with factories playing and breadwinners coming home to be greeted by their children. <clears throat> And others more generalized, brawny workers and farmers and heroic soldiers or square-jawed engineers and wise scientists and compassionate nurtures, nurses and teachers and busy clerks and typewriters and mothers with tow-haired moppets, that category which Luz realized with a degree of amusement now included herself. 
all marching forward under Uncle Teddy's direction into the radiant future amid idealized harvest fields and laden orchards and busy but rather too clean for real factories and irrigation canals threading the desert laboratories and schools and playgrounds. The only real differences from the poster she remembered from 16 was that the aspirational ideal farmers were nearly all on tractors rather than driving new or horse teams, which really was happening, but not nearly that quickly. And that for the campaigns of 1920 and still more of 22, a light sprinkling of the soldiers, workers, nurses, mothers, and tots had been Negro. In fact, one scientist was clearly modeled on George Washington Carver if you'd crossed him with the Greek god Zeus, put him in a white coat, and given him a look of ruptured mobility as he held up a test tube. The 22 midterms, a couple of others look rather Mexican in an idealized way, accomplished by bronzing them up a bit and throwing in sombreros, serape, and sandals. Four or five million Negroes voted in 1920, she thought, and we've given American citizenship to about a million Mexicans since the intervention started in 1913, one way or another. But it makes you so much more visible and so much more worth cultivating. It's working that way for women, too. Her cover persona this time actually was Mexican, and a landed blue blood who would think symbolizing her country by campesino looks and garb, either deeply ignorant or insanely annoying. Sin duda los gringos tienen buenas intenciones, she said aloud through clenched teeth. Doubtless the gringos mean well with intent to be overheard. In her own persona, Luz actually thought both the propaganda aimed at the newly numerous Mexican American vote and her cover's reaction to it hilarious. The posters had obviously been done by artists who got their idea of Mexico and its inhabitants by riffling through a few articles of National Geographic or Life, or possibly dime store illustrated westerns and Hollywood horse offers like The Taming of Texas Pete with Tom Mix subduing bandidos. And Mexicans of recover stripe like to pretend Mexico was much more Spanish and less Indio than it was, and the same for themselves. Luz had to restrain an impulse to mug it up further. She was supposed to be playing a type, not satirizing it for a comedy review. But there was one poster that really caught her eye, long enough to make her pause, and it probably did as much as all the others combined to explain why the last few elections hadn't been in the slightest doubt. People were looking at it, and looking disturbed when they moved on, even though it had been there long enough to peel and fade a bit. It was a huge and gruesomely detailed print, obviously closely copied from a photograph, showing a Paris street littered with slowly toppled autos and long dead horses still in the traces of wagons. <clears throat> Some of the automobiles had crashed and burned and others just stopped. Many of the wagons had lost a wheel or two to rust and freeze and thaw and lay with their contents spilled and drifts of leaves and detrius piled against everything. And the liquid slumped or auto mummified or just skeleton tattered bodies of men, women and children lying sprawled where a hundred odd tons of fecal gas had caught them that morning five years and three weeks ago. Correction, six years and three weeks ago. It would have killed the rats and flies too at those concentrations. But the few surviving scavengers had bred back very fast with plenty to eat and no one to disturb them. The twisted aluminum skeleton of a broken Zeppelin bomber was draped across a building in the middle distance, both burnt out shells. The photo must have been taken about a year after the sixth, Luz thought. She was much more familiar by now with the stages of unburied human decay than she'd ever want to be. Probably a picture by one of the German salvage teams. They'd gotten the surviving artwork and perishables by then, but didn't burn in the big fires. By 1917, they'd have had time to go in after the durable stuff, but it was before they salvaged the autos and scrap metals and so forth. And they're compulsive record keepers, even when they shouldn't be, and have absolutely no sense of public relations at all. So it probably wouldn't occur to them not to have a photo photographer along. That accorded with the German soldiers in suits like deep sea divers and spike top globe helmets and with glass face masks and breathing tubes and oxygen bottles on their backs, pushing hand carts full of gold ingots from the ruins of the Bank of France towards a mobile decontamination chamber and a convoy of blocky stoler motor trucks on wartime spring steel wheels. Even VGAS didn't last forever, but in 1917 they would have still have been taking no chances, especially in dark, cool, protected spots like a bank vault or something heavier than air could pool and wait with an infinite impersonal malice. And the gold wasn't going anywhere. They'd use it to back loans in their currency while it was still down in their, there in the poison dark, for that matter. One woman's body in the foreground was collapsed over the corpse of a child, where she had thrown herself in a vain attempt at protection, only a tiny withered hand showing. The air had been full of invisible death that morning, and there had been no shelter. What was that? bit from the book of Joshua that Henrietta, Henrietta quoted about it, Luz thought, 
Her friend Henrietta Colmer was from Georgia and raised a Baptist. It goes, she quoted under her breath, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both the man and the woman, the young and the old, the ox and the sheep and the ass, at the edge of the sword, as the Lord God of Israel had commanded. Some things don't change, she thought, except to get faster with modern labor-saving devices. The titles above and below the photo photograph-derived print were, This Could Have Been Us, and The President Kept Us Safe and Strong. We did keep that away from our home shores and our people, she murmured to Kira, in Chinese, so no one was likely to understand, even if they overheard. If we never do a worthwhile thing again in all our lives, you and I kept Boston and New York and Washington from being like that. Kira nodded, but she was a little white around the mouth and she was blinking. Yes, she said in English. It was meaningless without the context of Luz's words. But all those people we didn't save, all those poor people, the children. Luz started to take her arm, all they could do in public, though a hug would be all right if there was actual weeping. At that moment, Patricia trotted away from Susan Zhao's side and tugged at Kira's hand, looking up earnestly and obviously on the verge of tears herself. Don't be sad, Mommy Kay. Don't be sad. Don't cry, Mommy. Please don't cry. Mommy Luz, kiss it all better so Mommy Kay don't cry. Kira blinked again, wiped her eyes with the back of her hand, and lifted Patricia's small, solid weight up onto her hip. Slightly difficult since their children were in miniature but bulky camera hair overcoats, which made them almost square. Sure, and how could I be sad with my little patty pat to love me, she said. Patricia wordlessly threw her arms around Kira's neck and jammed her face into the angle with her shoulder. Luz looked at her partner over the small fair head and put her hand on it, stroking and smiling as she felt the child relax. That's another worthwhile thing we've done, isn't it? She said gently, seeing Kira's face at clench as well. Worthwhile as all the world, my heart. A few people gave her odd looks as they passed during the little exchange, but Luz wasn't much worried. Households with two women raising children together weren't common, but they were far from rare in the post-war era, in a country with thousands upon thousands of war widows among the native population, and even more in the overwhelming immigrant flood. Young men were a minority in half the world these days, between death and battle, crippling wounds, and preemptive massacre of potential fighters and fathers. Most of the women making their homes together were doing it for practical reasons, shared expenses, shared labor, friendship, and loneliness. But it was useful camouflage for those who weren't. It helped that women were expected to be much more demonstratively affectionate than men. In fact, she thought, whenever I become unbearably annoyed by rampant stupid, it also helps to think how much worse off men in our situation are, poor fellows. A lot of the excuses for being a confirmed bachelor just don't fly anymore. Wow. Okay, so this is the fourth book in this series. Uh, what are you working on now, given the kind of year it's been? Well, I'm working on the next one and some other projects. And uh, do you think uh, the last change book came out in 2018? Do you think you'll ever return to the Emberverse? Um, it's possible, but that depends on the publishers. I always try to make uh, room for sequels in any series. I know if you're writing a, in an imagined world, the world should be ample to have any number of books in it because after all, the real one is, and we're not bored with that yet. Um, Penguin didn't want to go on with the series after that. Right. Nope. Oh. Well, thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate you being part of Bubonicon 52. Mm -hmm. No problem. My pleasure. I've always enjoyed the local con.